I am certain that you have potentially noticed um, today for the first time or at some point in your time at Creekwood that behind me is a quite a large cross. Um, I think it's over a thousand pounds perhaps. We haven't had the chance to lift it up myself, but um, it is certainly placed in a position of prominence where when you come in, no matter what else is on the stage, it is really hard to miss that there is this giant cross um, just prominently displayed in front of you. And, and as you drive in from Stacy, the trees covered a little bit more, but there's a giant cross, the glimmering in white paint behind me over there. As you drive in off Country Club, there's another 20 foot tall giant cross that gets everybody's attention as they drive past on Country Club. Um, and not only that, but today I've already noticed amongst people who have walked in around your neck, you might have a cross that's hanging around your neck. And billions of people today around the world and every day will have this cross symbol around their neck or hanging from their car mirrors or plastered on the back of their car, maybe tattooed on their shoulder. Somewhere you will see in all of society there is this uh, the the depiction of the cross. There's no more clear symbol to suggest that you believe in and are a follower of Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Christ, which is historically an odd thing. Because if you were to ask the people of Jesus' day why you were carrying crosses around, all they would imagine is this brutal form of torture and execution that the Romans had devised. It was perhaps their cruelest invention. And it was also prominent because if you were an insurrectionist or if you were a thief or if you were a murderer or if you were uh, uh, found guilty of capital offenses, they would hang you from a cross. The crucifixion is not the only crucifixion. It was quite a popular thing to do. And they would hang you from a cross. They would actually usually not nail you. They would strap you with ropes to a cross and you would suffocate as you were on this cross. And it wasn't in some backyard garden or hidden away. It was crosses that were put along highways on major trade routes so that all of the Roman subjects would walk by and they would see the consequences of what it means to break the Roman order. The the consequences of what it meant to upset the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome that was brought forth by might and power. And yet sometime, somehow, In this moment that we now call the crucifixion or Good Friday, somehow or another, this instrument of torture and persecution has flipped over to where billions of people have these crosses prominently displayed as a symbol of hope and promise and peace. And that's what we're going to explore over these five weeks and and culminating in Easter is um, not what would Jesus do, because that's kind of a, a methodology of determining future behavior, but what did Jesus do? What is it about the cross, what is it about Jesus that uh, was so transformational in that moment that brings us to sacrifice our time, our lives, our resources, our finances, giving, uh, serving, all of those things because we are willing to take up our cross and follow him. And now, no surprise, there's a lot of disagreement about what actually happens on the cross and in resurrection. It is Christianity across the world. There are 8 billion people. There are about... You know, 2.5 billion Christians in the world, we all have a few different ideas throughout history as to what happens on this. And part of the confusion that's going to happen, perhaps in your mind, if you're here all five weeks, is that we're going to lay out these different theories of a word called atonement, which comes from a Latin word that means unify. So what happens on the cross and through resurrection is that we are unified with God, reconciled with God, reconciled with each other, unified with each other. Uh, what's going to happen is if, as you hear all of these different theories of what Jesus did on the cross— You might get a little confused because they're going to be different theories and yet all of them are biblical. And all of them are going to make sense. And then also all of them are going to have problems as well. And what it really will hopefully go to show is that it's just another conversation, another example of how God and God's activity is so large and so kind of beyond our own wisdom that there's a certain amount of mystery that goes into it. There's a certain amount of uh, understanding. But the one thing I know we can all agree on is that... We are here because we believe that Jesus saves, that Jesus saves us. But the question usually is, from whom, from what, to what? So that's what we'll be exploring through these different theories, is what is Jesus saving us from, and then how does that affect how we go about in our daily lives 
after that. And so today we're going to talk about the most popular atonement theory uh, of what Jesus did on the cross. It's called substitutionary atonement theory, um, and it is generally found in um, it is generally found in more of your southern churches or more evangelical conservative churches, Assemblies of God, Pentecostal, Southern Baptist, but. Every single person in here, when I start talking about this, will have been impacted by substitutionary atonement on some level because it is littered throughout the Bible. Um, And and we'll see what the blessings and and curses of this theory are. And so let me read you our scripture passage about that that mentions this. It's from Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. And this is Paul writing to this church saying, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, this is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say, thanks be to God. Um, so look, I need to pause and ask you a question to kind of get a baseline and, and maybe a metaphor for the whole thing is, um, if I show you a picture of this room, Dana, if you could put the picture of the room up, how many of you are super stressed out by the picture on the left? Raise your hand. A few people. Not everybody, though, right? There's a few people that are on the right side saying, like, you know, or the few people on the left side who are just saying that's totally fine. So, so on a scale, like, right, this is probably a middle schooler's room or maybe a teenager's room, perhaps. Maybe it's just a single guy who has no accountability whatsoever. Um, this is, so let me, on a sliding scale of Monica Geller, I sanitize my countertop seven times a day just because there might be something to... I'm an artist, laissez-faire, whatever happens will happen, right? So if you're the Monica Geller, raise your hands. Okay, so you've got to have everything completely in order. Everything's got to be in line to make you, make you joyful. Raise your hand if you're on the other side and it's like, you know what, I can live in this room over here. We've got a lot of kids and teenagers who are raising their hand. Lynn, wow, I did not know that whatsoever. Okay, so two different extremes. But the thing is, is so let me just take the, the last group of people, like the kind of artistic, you know, whatever. I can live in an environmentally messy place and, and be just fine with that. Every, you know, if you feel like you are that, you know, lazy affair, it doesn't really matter. Do you have piles? And what I mean by that is do you have certain piles where it doesn't matter if everything is out and messy as long as everything is in the right pile? Raise your hand if you've got piles. Yeah, everybody who's that. So, right, so it's messy but it's orderly messy, right? It's, my, it's, it's messy, but as long as it's my mess, I know where everything is. And, and that may look like chaos, but I tell you what, that's what my daughter's room looks like. And she can find anything you want her to find, whatever she needs it. Now, if you are on the uh, more orderly side of the Monica Geller insaneness of, of cleanliness, right? If you are on that side, um, do you have a secret closet or otherwise that is allowed to be messy as long as no one can see it? Raise your hand. Thank you for confessing, right? Everything looks organized, but you've got your own system of mess, right? We're all in need of grace. We're all in need of mess. Um, and this is kind of, this is the understanding. So when I was in, uh, when I was growing up, elementary school, we had a really large house over on River Oaks and where you walked in from the garage, the front door kind of entered into the kitchen and the family room. And uh, there was my own system of cleanliness suggested that there was a lazy boy recliner and there was a couch. And there was this small kind of like three foot section, three foot by one foot section. And I was, was so desperate after a long day of hard third grade education that I just needed the Lazy Boy and Cheetos and TV as soon as possible. So I would run to Lazy Boy, I'd plop down, I'd take off the Air Jordans and I'd put them down right in this little space. And um, guess how many times I cleaned those up before I went to bed? Without being told at least. You know, absolutely zero. So they're there. So then Tuesday comes around, I've got kids on, I come home, sit down in the Lazy Boy, take the kids off, put them on top of the Air Jordans, and they're maybe right beside. And in my mind, when you enter in, you can't see those. But on Wednesday, I'm wearing a different pair of shoes. So I'm putting that, and eventually by Friday, and I don't know why I had so many pairs of shoes, but eventually by Friday, those shoes are downstairs, so they're inconvenient to put on. So I just put on my next pair of shoes, go on, and eventually I form kind of the great pyramid of David Lesnar's shoes in between the lazy boy and the, and the couch. And it drove my mom nuts. I mean, just absolutely nuts. And in my way of thinking, you can't see them, it's fine. But in my mom's way of thinking, that's not where the shoes go. Now, who is in charge of where things should go when you are a third grader versus your mother? 
mom. Hopefully, if everything's falling in the right order. So when I didn't put my shoes away and I formed the mount of David's shoes, there were consequences of that. I usually had to do more chores to make up for the things that I hadn't done in that moment. I also, when I'd come home and I was in such a hurry for my just lackadaisical lifestyle, that my backpack would go right in this triangle. Kitchen, family room, garage door. And for whatever reason, I thought my bag needed to be at the crossroads of all of those, right smack in the middle. And so my dad would come home, and he would come in, and if he wasn't paying attention, he could trip over that incredibly easy. If anybody was coming from the kitchen, they would round about the bar, and they would hit my bag. So my dad, in frustration, would take the bag and throw it over against the wall, and I was so mad that he would do this. Because how am I going to know where my bag is if it's not right in the center of everything? And we found we had some, some differences of opinion on orderliness. But again, guess who wins in that argument? The third grader or my dad? My dad, right? There was breaking of the covenant. There was breaking of the order of where things should go. And there were consequences as to when you break that law. So, Dana, put the scripture passages up. When you look at, um, when you look at the orderliness of the world... Um, when Paul is writing to the Galatians, he is encouraging them to live by faith, to understand grace. He's encouraging them to break away from evaluating themselves based upon the law, based upon the order. But the understanding is still that God has a perfect order of things, that God really loves order, God really loves boundaries, God is perfection. And so in order to be associated with God or at one with God, atoned with God, that we also have to live into perfection. So he talks about this curse is everyone who hangs, uh, that cursed by the law. So Christ became the curse by hanging on a tree. And he quotes Deuteronomy 21 because the assumption is that anybody who is being punished has sinned for that punishment. That there is a cause and effect, a uh, reaction and a reaction. And so anyone who is being punished by death has the wages of sin, as he talks to the Romans about, our death. So the assumption is that if, when we mess up, when the shoes go in the wrong place, when we lie, when we cheat, when we do those things, what we are doing is we are disrupting the perfect harmony and order that God has created. And that's where we get these 613 laws that come in to try and create the environment of perfect harmony, perfect order, everything going in the right place at the right time. So it's not God punishing us necessarily. It's just that we have broken God's order of perfection, and therefore there has to be consequences. And really before, you know, so when we look at the laws of the Old Testament, so like Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy is where we're going to find the laws of the Old Testament. And um, these are all laws and, uh, to create boundary and orders, but for a very specific reason. So when you're walking through the wilderness of Leviticus and you are surrounded by the Ammonites and the Hittites and the Philistines and all of these other different tribes around you, the purpose of the law in Leviticus is not necessarily this ideal purity. It is how do we make ourselves distinctively Hebrew? How do we make ourselves distinctively God's chosen people in opposition sometimes to what's going on around us? So when we look at like Leviticus 19.38, I believe it is, is um, you shall not make any markings of the dead on your body or have any tattoos. This has been used for years to say that that mistake you made on your lower back at spring break is sinful and God doesn't like you anymore. Or the, or the flower that you made or the cross you have on your shoulder, for example, right? That you should not make these images on your body. What it's really looking at is I'm wandering through the wilderness and there are tribes and there are people that in their religious ceremonies worshiping their gods or their ancestors are making marks on their bodies to honor and worship these other gods. And so that's a no-no. It's a boundary that we're setting, and if you go outside of that boundary and start worshiping other gods, well, that disrupts the perfection of who God's people are supposed to be. And there is such a lockstep, tight-knit association between God's chosen people and God. In this time and place, how you were was a reflection on your God. I mean, even to the point of warfare, where if you were improper and unclean in your war camp, then God wouldn't be on your side in warfare, or your God lost in warfare. So, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, have this law that is trying to get them to fit within the boundaries and borders of what perfect and holy and righteous look like. And if you cannot live up to that, 
Well, that's why all the consequences are you have to go out of the camp. You have to go out of the house. You have to be outside of this. If you are unclean, you have to be outside of the temple. You're not allowed to enter in the temple. If you've got a broken leg, you can't enter into the temple because you have a blemish. And God has no blemishes or can be associated with no blemishes. If you have a skin disease, God can't be associated with leprosy or skin diseases because God is perfect. And so what I want you to hear is that substitutionary atonement or Jesus dying for our sins has often been framed in kind of Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hand of an angry God, that God is just mad that we are hurting people, you know, that God is just angry with us, that God really is wrathful. And that's not really what the, the theory is about. It's that God is just. And so look at, the, um, look at the statue that's outside of the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. And you'll find a woman who's blindfolded holding scales. When you've got scales, right, the scales are perfectly balanced, that everything is in harmony. It's kind of this homeostasis of justice. Well, when I do something, when I pile on or mess up the homeostasis and the scales tip, well, things fall over. There are consequences to that. And, and it's blindfolded because justice is supposed to not be in a reactionary emotional decision. It's just supposed to be, you did this, therefore you deserve that, and this is what God has set up. So the understanding then is, so right, there are boundaries, there are, perf- there are boundaries to perfection and orderliness. It is tov, this is the Hebrew word when God creates the world in Genesis 1, says things are good. It's not, hey, I'm really excited about this, these are good. It's tov, tov means in line with God's purposes. I designed this to be in line with my purpose. Our job is to steward things in line with God's purpose. When we break that, there are consequences to those actions. So we see the sacrificial system in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that if you mess up something, you have to go offer a dove or a pigeon or a goat. Even if you are bleeding, like order and orderliness, if bodily fluids come out of your body, body fluids are supposed to stay in your body. So if they come out, even if it's like during monthly menstruation or pregnancy, you are considered unclean and unorderly. So you have to go atone for the unorderliness of your body by sacrificing something. And this is, this is where the wages of sin are death, right? We can't be associated with a perfect God if we are imperfect. So we have to be exited out of the system. That is either death, it is either disbarment, it is, you know, whatever that might be. And so in the understanding in the Old Testament is God's compassion is the sacrificial system. That if God is going to remain just and fair and blind to, you know, unemotional, then we have to still sacrifice, we have to substitute something for our disorder. So if our room is messy, we have to offer a pigeon for creating messiness. We have to give life because our life really should not be in God's life is the understanding. And so the sacrificial system becomes this act of compassion. And what we see in the New Testament, as we see as Jesus comes along in this immense act of compassion, this immense act of love, is it's kind of the understanding that that God looked upon humankind and says, you're just not doing it. You can't do it right. You're never going to get there. And so I'm just going to go ahead and take care of this for you. And I'm going to offer the perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb, the, the one that is the, the Passover lamb, for instance, so that, so that I will satisfy all of the justice needs. I'll satisfy the disorder. I'll satisfy my anger at the disorder so that life can continue, so that you can get passed by, by the angel of death, so that you can remain along inside of the world that God wants you to be a part of. Now, there are some problems with this. There's some problems from a biblical study standpoint in that it is a salvation that is gained by, a, by satisfying justice. That if there, if there is a consequence, if there's an action, a consequence, then there has to be another kind of making up for the consequence. Uh, which sounds a little bit like works righteousness. And we could point back to Abraham and say that Abraham was justified by faith, as it says in Hebrews 11. He didn't have the sacrificial system, yet he was still one with God. He was still walking with God. We can also look at the life of Jesus, who does approach people who with leprosy and other diseases, and he heals them, sends them to the temple, and makes them atoned, even though there was no blood or life-giving involved. So there's some biblical studies part. There's also this reactionary— there's also just the kind of emotional reaction of, are we really comfortable with a God who is just has to have bloodshed to make everything okay? Are we okay with a God who needs death to happen to be satisfied? Are, are we okay with that? And, and I say, are we okay with that? Not from the standpoint that God can't do whatever God wants to do, but it tends to um, build up in us a little bit of a reaction that when something is outside of the boundaries of justice or normal, and not like justice in terms of making everything great for everybody, but justice in terms of actions and consequences, when somebody breaks that covenant with us 
and we are a substitutionary atonement subscriber, while we should forgive them because God has sent Jesus for their sins as well, what can happen is that we are modeled after a God who wants vengeance or justice. And so we will attack, or we will put our thumb down, or we think those people should be excluded or killed or bombed or otherwise. And so it can lead to some violent behavior and some violent um, attitudes of exclusion or just destruction in the world, all in the name of God. Because there's no way God would ever want this disorder and chaos in God's world. And so I'll pull you back to what it's really about. It's really saying the that God recognizes the limitations of human free will. God recognizes the limits of human achievement and wisdom, and that there is never anything we can ever do to buy our way out of the mistakes we have made or to recompense for the overall mistakes that we have made. And so knowing that, God was compassionate and graceful enough, kind enough to say, you know what, you're never going to be able to pay this price. And so I am going to send my son who is perfect and blameless and universally good. And he is going to pay the price for you. He is going to be the ultimate sacrifice for all time, for all sin. Because I love you that much. And what I hope is, yeah, there may be some problems with this, but what I hope you hear from that is just this immense gratitude. This immense gratitude that a God who has every right to do whatever God wants and chooses love, chooses sacrifice, chooses you and me. And so we go from this place not out of obligation of the law, that we have to achieve the benchmarks of the merit badges of the law, but we go from this place in gratitude that God has already done that for us. And we get to be free to joyfully express that same love to others. So let's pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for your amazing grace. We are thankful for the love that you see us to where our mistakes, our breaches of the law are no longer what define us. But we are only seen through your loving gaze because of your sacrifice of Jesus for our sake. And so may we, Lord, not um, leave here with a sense of obligation, but may we do cartwheels of thankfulness. And may we see others who might be struggling under the burdens of the weight of the law. And may we set them free, knowing that they are loved and they are worthy of love. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.